So before we jump into God's word, let's pray one more time, okay? God, when we read your word, we are reading words that you are addressing to us. As we study your word right now, we're studying words that you want us to know, you want us to do, you want these words to shape our lives. So please, would you do that as a result of our time here now? Make your truth real to us. Let us know exactly how to live what we're going to see in this passage. Do this, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was talking with a friend of mine last night, and um, he lives in Huntington Beach, California. And recently in Huntington Beach, they had this huge air show. Powerful jets, the, some of the most powerful in our arsenal, were flying all over Huntington Beach. People from miles around, even other states, came to this air show. It was pretty incredible. And um, all these people from other states knew about it, but my friend didn't know about it. And so he's sitting in his house. And suddenly the whole thing starts shaking and he's freaking out because all these jets are flying over. And he says to me, the last time that jets flew over my house was on 9-11. So I thought we were under attack. So he, he said he heard it. He runs outside, sees all the jets, runs back inside, tells his wife, pack a bag. We're getting the kids out of school. We're getting out of here. We're under attack. He told me his wife is still not letting him to get, get away with that. She is still making fun of him. And, uh, but then it was funny because then it started a conversation about like him saying, gosh, I don't, what would I do if, I, how, do I, how do I get ready? Like, what would I do if we were under attack? How, how, re how, how easily could I get to safety? How ready would I be to take care of my family? How ready would I be to face some attack or a national disaster? We're going back and forth like, yeah, I don't know. Like, should we go buy a bunch of dried up fruit, food and put it in our garage? Like, what, what should we do? But it, it got us thinking, what does it mean to be ready for something like that? Now open your Bibles to Mark 13. We've been looking at, at Mark 13. This is our sixth and final message in this passage. We're just working our way through it. And by the time we get to the end of Mark 13, Jesus doesn't hide the effect that he wants this message to have. He's not interested in the sensational or the theatrical. He's not interested in, 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 in answering every question. I was talking to someone after the first service, and I said to them, well, I'm kind of vague in what I'm saying and all of the details of the end times because Jesus is vague. He doesn't talk about everything. He doesn't dot every I and cross every T on the end times. And so I'm not going to. I'm going to be vague because Jesus is vague. But he's not vague about how he wants this message to change our lives. This is not given to increase your... Um, to, get in, to, to increase your, your ability to think through end times issues, nor is it gil, given to kind of whet your appetite and go, oh yeah, you know, I want to know more about end times. This is given to change your life. This is given to make you ready for Jesus to come back if he were to come back today. Take a look at it starting in verse 28. This is the effect that Jesus wants us to have to his message. So he, he completes... Uh, all of the signs and everything that he's been talking about, verses 1 to 27, or 5 to 27. And then he starts his conclusion with this lesson. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch become, comes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things take place, you know that he is near at the very gates Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you don't know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay 
awake. The question each one of us is left with as we conclude our look at Jesus teaching on the end of the world is what difference is this making in your life? How should this be changing you personally? And Jesus answers that question in no uncertain terms. The bottom line of this message is that there should be something in you that's saying, I need to get ready for this. I need my life to be ready for this. You must be alert. Are you? We must be awake and focused and ready for the return of Christ. If you believe this truth, but this truth, that truth has an impact your life, Jesus makes one final plea to your soul. He speaks right to your heart and says, are you ready? You must be ready now, not tomorrow, not next week, not when you're done with high school, not when you're done with college, not when the kids move out. You must be ready now. This very second. In a state of constant readiness, that's what these words mean. Constantly ready, always prepared. Ceaseless preparation, immediately ready for use. This idea is that, that he could right now at this very moment come, show up, and you will meet him face to face. This is how he concludes his prophetic look at the destruction of the temple that happened in 70 AD and his look at the end of this world. In fact, this has been the overall message of prophecy. Take a look at verse 5. Notice the first words out of the gate are not okay. Let me tell you who the Antichrist is. His first words are, see to it, which translated in verse 32 is, or 33 is, be on your guard. Verse 9 be on your guard. Verse 23, be on your guard. Verse 33, be on guard. Keep awake. 35, stay awake. 37, stay awake. We need to be ready at any moment. And he's, and he's saying, okay, here are things you need to be ready for. Verses 5 to 13, you've got to be ready for the dangers that are coming. You've got to be ready for the, the earthquakes and the wars and, and all of the, the persecution and the, and the, the famine and, and all of the false teachers. You've got to be ready for that. Be on guard. But he also says, hey, verses 33 to 37, you've got to be on guard. You've got to be ready any moment for me to return. So before we jump into the text, we we have to take a step back and we have to ask ourselves, are we ready for the return of Jesus? And and what I don't mean by that is this, because right, we we see something bad that happens on television or or where we or something happens in our lives and we just do a Jesus, you can just come back now. Just come back now. I'm ready to go. That's not what he's talking about. He's he's he wants he wants you to think through like one way to be ready, are you saved? Are you saved? Have you given your life to Christ? Is there, have you, have you turned over the allegiance of your life from yourself, living for yourself, and given your allegiance to Jesus? Are you trusting in him to save you and not your good works? Are you, have, you, are you, have you repented of your sins? Have you turned from your sins and given your allegiance to Jesus? Do you know him? Will, will he know you? And then if, if you can say yes to those things, then the question is, are you growing in those things? Are you growing in your love for him? Are you serving him? Are you living for him? Are you fighting your sin? Are you pursuing holiness? Are you praying and bearing fruit and, and proving by your deeds that you know him? And are you advancing his love in the world? Are you advancing his mission where you live or where you work or where you study or where you play or where you go to church? Like, are you honoring him? 1 John 2.28 is a very significant passage. We're not going to turn to it. I'm just going to paraphrase it right now. But what it says, 1 John 2.28 says that there will be Christians when he returns who will be ashamed. Who will be ashamed. That this moment of joy, this moment of, of incredible wonder and satisfaction and amazement are ones where they're like, oh no, not now. Not now. Anytime but now. They're going to be ashamed. And so this passage for all of us is, is Jesus very gently as our good shepherd is going, hey. But, but with some force, he's going, hey, stay awake. Be on guard. 
He could come back right now. Would you be ashamed? Ashamed of how you're living? Ashamed of your worldly desires? Ashamed of messed up priorities? Are you ready? Are you staying ready for Jesus to return? This is the bottom line of our passage. We saw the commands over and over again. It's a really easy one to to show. You can just read it and go, well, I think that's really what he's saying. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. This is our sixth and final message in the series. And every single one of these messages is basically that. Are you ready? Are you staying ready so that right now you are ready for Jesus to return? Now, before we look at verse 28 of Mark chapter 13, let me remind you of the context. This is Tuesday. Jesus has had a long day of arguing with the religious leaders. They have rejected him. We've actually seen that. You can see it in chapters 11 and 12. They actually want him dead. They're plotting his death. And so the response to that is that the the people, um, as he's leaving the temple area, he stops and he looks back at the temple. He gets all of his guys to look at the temple and he says, hey, you see all of this temple up here? Not one stone is going to be left on another. All of it's coming down. He makes this prediction of the destruction of the temple. Chapter 13 still. Chapter verse 4, his disciples are like, what in the world are you talking about? And so they ask him two questions. Look at verse 4. Two questions. They said, hey, Jesus, um, when will these things be? Verse 4. When is this going to happen? When is all this destruction going to happen? When is this going to be? So they're asking about the time. And two, what will be the sign? Is is there some event that's going to tell us when this stuff is close so that we can prepare for it? When will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Not when they are going to be, but, but when they're about to be so that we can prepare and maybe like run away. Well, when we get to the end of verse 27, Jesus has answered their second question. Verse 4, second question, what will be the sign? Jesus answers that question, verse 14, when you see, look at verse 14, when you see the abomination of desolation, run away. So when you see this moment, this is the sign that you're looking for. When you see this, now you can run, now you can be free, now you can get away. So when we get to verse 28 of Mark 13, Jesus is now answering their first question. And their first question, like I said, has to do with time. When will these things be? Jesus is now going to answer that question. He shifts his focus from the event, from the the sign, and now shifts it to the timing of the event. So let's dig into verse 28 again. Let me read this again. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender, puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. There's a lot of prophecy details that many of you know, like we can get lost in here. And we're going to talk about that briefly, but I don't want us to miss the point. Did you see what Jesus said about his words? He said, if there's a competition between which is going to last longer, my words or the universe, my words are going to win. Do you see that? Jesus said the whole universe will disappear before this prophecy fails. He's saying his words are going to outlast the universe. When you think about things that are reliable, you think death, taxes, and the sun coming up. And he says, my words are more reliable, more stable. My words are more certain than the universe that you see every day. With these last words, Jesus is like calling his shot. He's like putting his his bat up and he's going, yeah, I'm going to hit this out of the park. Like I'm going to destroy this. And I'm going to sign my name. Heaven and earth is going to pass away before my words do. This is the same way, by the way, that, that God talked about his words in the Old Testament. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers and the flower fades, but what? The word of the Lord stands forever. Isaiah 55, 11, my word shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So don't miss this. With these words, Jesus is putting his words on par with the Old Testament. 
And you only do that if the person speaking is God. Jesus puts his words on par with the word of God. Now, for a Jewish person to say that, I mean, you see guys on the internet saying that all the time. But for a Jewish person raised in a Jewish context to do something like that, it's either blasphemy or it's true. Well, the question then was, was he right, right? That's the question. Did he actually predict the time when it would happen? I mean, what does it say here? It says that, well, let, let's take a look at verse 28. Fig trees mean summer's coming, right? So when, when the fig tree, when there's leaves on the fig tree, that means summer is here. Is that what it says? No, I heard that. No, it means that summer is near, meaning summer's not here yet. It's close, but it's not here. Well, that's an illustration for verse 29. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. So now this is one of those nerd moments, okay? So if you're not a Bible nerd, just, try, just, just follow along. But if you are a Bible nerd, this is your red meat moment. So here's your red meat. Okay, so when you see what things, verse 29, when you see what things? Well, it's natural to think that these things refer to verses 24 to 27. When you see the return of Jesus, the catastrophe of the universe, the gathering of the elect, but be careful. If these things in verse 29 are the things described in verses 24 to 27, you've got a problem because notice this is how it would read. When you see the disintegration of the universe, the return of Jesus, and the gathering of his people, then you know that Jesus is near. See the problem in that? How can he be near if he's here? Okay, so, so, so it can't be verses 24 to 27. <coughs> just doesn't make sense. So I think that these things are not verses 24 to 27, but that these things are the these things of verse 4. Look at verse 4 again. It says, when will these things be? What things? Well, I think it's the things. That, the things that these guys are asking about are... When is this destruction going to happen? And what are the signs leading up to the destruction so we can be free from it? So what are the these things in verse 29? I think it's the wars and the earthquakes and the natural disasters, the persecution, the false teachers, and ultimately this abomination of desolation thing that signals the temple is about to be destroyed. So look at verse 29 again. It starts with this phrase, um, when you see. Well, you know what? That phrase is used only one other time in this entire passage, and it's in verse 14. When you see the abomination of desolation, it's referring, that, that little phrase refers to the signs. So I think verse 29 means when you see the signs, especially the abomination of desolation, you know that it, the destruction of the temple, is near at the very gates. What gates? The gates that lead into the city of Jerusalem. Well, this moment, if you have an ESV, you might be going, now, wait a minute, John, wait a minute. My Bible says you know that he is near. That's the return of Jesus. Now, the ESV does say that, but, but this is where I have to go even more nerdy on you right now. In Greek, this word that's translated he can actually be translated he, she, or it. And the, the translation depends on the context. So... If verse 29 refers to the signs, which is what I argued, and if verse 29 can't be the return of Jesus because it creates that how can he be here and near at the same time thing, then if you have an ESV or if you have some other translation, you should cross out the he, I think, and put it. If you have an NIV, a New King James, or a King James, you don't need to do that because you already know what. Your Bible says it already. So, nerd moment, Greeky nerd moment over. How long is this supposed to last? How long are they supposed to, how long do people have to wait before all of this happens? Not long. Look at verse 30. Verse 30. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Hmm. I think the easiest way to understand this passage is just what it says. People who are alive right now, this generation, 
will not pass away until all these things take place. That's the easiest way to understand this verse. With these words, Jesus answers their first question back in verse 4. Look back at verse 4 one more time. When will these things be? He answers the question. Some alive at the time I'm saying these words, which was around 30 AD, will still be alive when the temple is destroyed. That's a pretty specific prediction. Was he right? What's the answer? He was right. In the Bible, a generation is about 40 years, and wouldn't you know it, 40 years from this moment, in 70 AD, the temple is destroyed, Jerusalem has fallen, and over a million Jews have been massacred by Roman armies. I think the most natural reading is the correct reading. This generation refers to people who were alive when Jesus said these words. But wait, John, wait a minute. Verse 30 says, all these things will take place. And because it says all, that's got to include verses 24 to 27. It's got to refer to the return of Jesus, right? I don't think so. Look back at verse 4 one last time. When will these things be, and what will be the sign when what? All these things take place. What things? The destruction of the temple and the signs surrounding it. So I think verse 30 means, quote, Truly I say to you, people alive today will not die until the temple is destroyed and not one stone is left upon another. And like I said, he got it right exactly Exactly. Okay? So we've done a couple nerd moments just now. But now let's take a step back and all of us together think through this. Jesus predicts the future. Temple's going to be destroyed, and it happens. If Jesus predicts the extent of that destruction, not one stone is going to be left on another, and it happens. And if he predicts the timing of that destruction... 40 years, one generation, and it happens. And let me ask you this question. Why in the world would we ever doubt him about anything? Why would we doubt him? Why do we doubt him? The way I put it for point number one, we stay ready for Jesus to return by being confident in the word of God. Be confident in the Word of God. It's very cool for Christians today to stop being confident about the Bible. uh, Did you hear about this prominent pastor recently who said, you know, we need to get rid of the, the foundation of our Christianity being the Bible. We need to move it from the Bible over to Jesus' resurrection. And that's great, okay? The the core of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus. Great. Where do you hear about the resurrection of Jesus? Whoops. The Bible. Where do you hear about all these eyewitnesses that that talked about seeing Jesus? Oh, the Bible again. It's common for scholars and pastors to make concessions to non-Christians and agree with them that there are contradictions in the Bible, that historical details are false, that, that other details coming come from a you know, primitive culture that, that wasn't enlightened like ours, and so they got a bunch of problems and mistakes. And, and this is what pastors do. They go, well... Okay, sure. Okay, there are a bunch of contradictions in the Bible, but you know, God's bigger than our logic. He's bigger than our contradictions. Just, just don't worry about all that stuff. Just love Jesus. Here's the problem, though. Jesus said the Bible is truth, right? Your word is truth. Jesus also said that Matthew 4, 4, every word comes from the mouth of God. So if I'm going to follow Jesus, if I'm going to you know, forget the Bible and just follow Jesus, as, as I'm following Jesus, I'm going to realize that, wait, he didn't forget the Bible. He, he exalted the Bible. He saw it as the very word of God. So hear me on this. Are there things in the Bible that are hard to understand? Absolutely, there are lots of things that are hard to understand. Are there things that look like contradictions? Absolutely. Are there things that make us think there are errors in the Bible? There is. But are there contradictions in the Bible? No. 
Are there factual, historical, scientific errors in the Bible? No. Are there ethical uh, errors, immorality, evil that's being advocated in the Bible? No, there isn't. And here's the thing. There's not a question you could ask about the Bible or not a question you have coming from the Bible that hasn't already been answered. Did you know that? Like that's the, the, the beauty of, of being a part of a, 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 a religion that, that's 2,000 years old. People have been attacking this book for centuries. And you know what? People have been attacking it and people have been answering it. So there's not a question you have. There's not a doubt. There's not a, a contradiction that you're thinking, how can this be true that someone hasn't tried to answer it? And when you realize it, you go, oh, wow, that, that's pretty simple. I don't know why I didn't think of that. This is why we don't think of it. We have more access to more tools on Bible study than any Christians in the history of the world. That's not an exaggeration. That's true. And yet we don't care. We don't use it. Like, you could actually teach yourself Greek just on the internet. You don't even need to go to seminary. Hebrew, you don't even need to go to seminary. You could sit in your pajamas and teach yourself Greek. And then you'd be able to read the Bible and it's original, the New Testament at least, it's original language. Like you could do that all on the internet right now. We don't give a rip about that though. And so, are there ways, if you have doubts and you, you think that there are problems with the Bible, are there ways to get your questions answered? Yes. Are there answers to the doubts? Yes. But it takes study. It takes work. It takes you saying, like, I'm going to ask him, and if he doesn't know, I'm going to ask her, and if he does, she doesn't ask her, I'm going to ask him and her and him. I'm going to find out the answer to this question. And here's a dirty little secret about questions. The top scholars, Bible scholars in the country, their emails are on the websites of the schools that they teach at. You can email them. They will answer. It's crazy. They will actually answer you. The smartest people on the planet will answer you. It just takes diligence and hard work. But it's the best kind of work because when you're done with it, you don't just go, gosh, I'm smarter now. But your confidence in the Bible grows. And your, your affections and your thoughts about the Bible match what Jesus says when he says, heaven and earth is going to pass away. My words are never going to pass away. I want to illustrate this. Here's a guy, Simon Greenleaf. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was uh, the principal founder of the Harvard Law School and a world-renowned expert on evidence. He was an agnostic, an atheist, and uh, thought the resurrection was just, either, it was either a lie or a legend. Somebody made it up. And uh, that was until one of his students said, uh, you should consider the evidence. You're the expert, world expert on evidence. Why don't you consider the evidence for the resurrection? And he did that. And as a result of that study, he became convinced the resurrection actually happened. He rejected his atheism, embraced Christianity, became a defender of the Bible. Just someone smarter than everybody in this room. And he grew in confidence when he said, you know, I'm going I'm to check this out. Are there going to be mockers? Absolutely. Are there going to be people who laugh at you? Are there going to be people that think you're stupid for being confident in the word of God? Absolutely, there are going to be, no doubt. But what did Jesus say? They treated me this way, they're going to treat you this way too. If you get the same response Jesus did, then you're in good company. There will be scoffers, there will be mockers, but that shouldn't keep us from trusting this book and studying it and reading it and, and memorizing it and doing what it says and letting the mockers laugh at us. Because they are only going to laugh until the day when Jesus returns. And on the day that Jesus returns, there will be no more laughing, right? God will be found true and every one of them will be found liars. And on that day, your affections will be filled with joy when you see what your heart was confident in would happen because you are confident in the word of God. 2 Peter 3, 4 says that people will mock us. They will say, hey, where's this Jesus guy? You've been talking about him. You, you people have been talking about him for centuries like he's coming back. Like, where is he? Where is the promise of his coming? 
And Jesus addresses this. Look at Mark 13, starting in verse 32. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. You don't know when the time will come. It's it's like a man going on a journey. He leaves home. He puts his servants in charge, each with his work. Commands the doorkeeper, stay awake. Look back at verse 32. Those words, but concerning, signal a change in subject. Paul would use this phrase in in 1 Corinthians. Every time he's answering a new question from this church, he, he starts with these words, but concerning. Before we look at that, let's take a step back and and think through a couple of things. The first thing I want you to see that Jesus makes it clear that all attempts at date setting are stupid. Let me just say that again. All attempts at date setting, stupid. I have to say this. You know why? Because people that set dates make a lot of money and get a lot of people buying their books. And where do they get it from? People in churches. Just let this verse sink in to your life. Anyone who follows a date setter, you have been duly warned not to. One author put it this way, I love it. He says, quote, It would be a proof of excessive pride and wicked covetousness to desire that we who creep on the earth should know more than is permitted to the angels in heaven and the Son himself about when he will return. God isn't telling the angels and isn't telling Jesus. Why in the world is he telling these hundreds of people that say Jesus is coming back on this day? He's not. He's never going to. Keep your money. Don't buy their books. All right, enough of that. Second, notice verse 32. Jesus said he didn't even know when he was going to return. I've been arguing for two years as we've been working our way through Mark. Mark. That every single passage in Mark, every single paragraph, every event is really teaching just one thing. That Jesus is the Christ and he's the son of God, which means that he's God with skin. Now, How can he be God and not know something if one of the attributes of God is that he knows everything? Well, how can Jesus be thirsty even though God has no needs? How can Jesus be about 30 years old and yet God is eternal? How can Jesus sleep even though God has all power? The answer is because Jesus is just as human as he is divine. And what Jesus did, according to Philippians chapter 2, is he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, a thing to be held on to. Which, by the way, means if he's holding on to it, means that he is equal with God. He says he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, but he emptied himself. It says that he took on the form of a servant. And one of the ways that he served was that he put the use of his God characteristics in the hand of the Father and said, you're you're going to be the one that determines when I do these things. So when he's reading people's minds, that's because God is allowing him to do that. When he's walking on water, that's because the Father is allowing him to do that. And in this case, we see the Father going, I'm not going to tell you that. You're going to have no knowledge of this. So that the world will see, again, that you are just as human as you are divine. Now look at verse 32. Again, this introduces a new subject. And so what is the new subject? I think the new subject is transferred from the first century in verses 28 to 31 to the end of the world in verses 32 to 37. And in particular, the time of Jesus' return. So look at verse 32 again. It says in... uh, But concerning that day, what day is that? Well, verse 24 um, talks about days after the tribulation. Verse 20 talks about days that were cut short. So what is that day? That is a technical phrase for the day of the Lord. That is a technical phrase of the day when God shows up and writes all wrongs. That is a day that the New Testament authors connect to the return of Jesus. Notice that day or that hour, no one knows about the angels or the son, only the father. So if nobody knows the day, what should our response be? He says, be on guard, keep awake. You don't know when the time is coming. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and he puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. 
You don't know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, at midnight, when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. It's not just for the four of you listening. It's for all, verse 37, everybody, all people, all Christians, all time, stay awake. Why? Because it could happen at any moment. In the evening, at midnight, the rooster crows, the morning, the afternoon, the mid-morning, the mid-evening. No one knows when. Point, be ready at any moment. Or the way I put it for point number two, you and I stay ready for the return of Jesus when point number two, we're watching and working. When we're watching and working. The event is certain. Jesus is coming back. The time is uncertain. It could happen at any moment. It could happen today. Are you ready? That's, that's that whole illustration about this, this guy, this owner of a house that, hey, I'm leaving. All of you got a job. You better do that job and I'm going to split out of here. But hey, doorkeeper, you need to stay awake because I could come back at any moment. I don't want to find any of you sleeping, he says. These commands speak of constant alertness, readiness, ready to, ready to go at, at a moment's notice, diligence, attention, urgency. There's no danger of being caught off guard, not lazy, not careless. So you think about, okay, more specifically, Jesus, what do you want us to be aware of? What, do you, what is it that you want us to be awake for? What do you want us to be ready for? I think if we look through chapter 13, there are three things he wants us to be ready for. The first is those disasters, like false teachers and, and earthquakes and persecution and, and wars and all that stuff. He wants us ready, awake, on guard for those things. Second, I think he wants us awake to anything approaching a repeat of the abomination of desolation, which it seems is going to happen again, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But most importantly, I think he wants us awake for his return. We're like servants. We know our master's coming home. We don't know when, which means that, that he wants us living under this shadow, under this reality, that Jesus could come back at any moment. He could come back today. It means that we live in, in such a way that it doesn't matter when he comes back. We're not like, okay, this is a good day and that's a bad day. We're just living every day with, okay, Jesus could return today. It means that we must so live that every day is suitable for his return. It means that we must be ready at any moment to meet him. It means the moments of our lives are preparation for us to meet Jesus. He wants us uh, watching, but look at verse 34 again. He also wants us working. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge. Notice this, each with his work. Each with his work. None of us found asleep, none of us lazy or negligent, not doing our jobs, never off duty. We should care that if he were to come back today that he doesn't find us living like he would never come back. It doesn't mean rest or don't have fun. It means don't make your whole life rest and having fun. It means no matter where you go or what you're doing, you're always on duty going to the store, going to school, going to church here, going wherever, always on duty, Lord, I'm ready for you. What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to talk to? Where do you want me to go? Don't forget the work each one of us has been given to do. I want you to see this. Keep your fingers here and turn to Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two. About seven books to the right. Ephesians, if you get to any books that start with T, you've gone too far. Ephesians chapter 2. God shows us here that when he saves us, he, he gives you a job. He says, here, I want you to do this. Take a look at Ephesians 2 and verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this, this faith, this grace, this salvation, this is not your own doing. You didn't save yourself. Salvation is the gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one can boast. Notice this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Translation, God has given you a job. He's prepared it for you. He wants you doing it. The question is, are you doing it? Now turn to Ephesians chapter 4 because this comes back again. Because the job of pastors is to equip you to do your job. Look at, look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. He gave the apostles, the prophets. We got those in the Bible here, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. There's that word work. There, there it is again. Your job, your ministry. That's to build up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He's just superly just going on and on. Like when you do your job, people grow, people change. Uh, everyone's growing. The whole church is growing spiritually. And as that's happening, like Christ is being exalted. The fullness of Christ is being experienced. We're no longer children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, human cunning, craftiness, and deceitful scheming. That's false teachers. But rather, we're speaking the truth. We're doing it in love. And when we do that, people grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Now watch this. From which the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped, when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Notice those words in verse 16. Each part working properly. You're a part. And you're a part. And I'm a part. And when we're all working properly, we grow. So are you working? Are you, what are you doing with your time and your talent and your treasure? The things that God has given you? This was Jesus' concern at the end of this message. Mark doesn't tell us, but, 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 but Matthew adds that Jesus tells this parable, right? Right at the end of this, he says, oh yeah, this, this whole thing is like a, uh, a master who has uh, three servants and says, hey, I'm going to leave and I'm going to give you 10 pieces of this money, this talent, and I'm going to give you five pieces. I'm going to give you one. And when I come back, I want to see that you did something with what I gave you, right? You remember this? So he comes back, and this guy who had 10 made 10 more, and this guy made five, made five more, this guy made one, didn't do anything with it. And he's not like, hey, that's no problem, whatever. Translation, what are you doing with, God, with what God gave you? Are you in the game? Are you working? Is it even, is it even on your radar, or, or are you just obsessed with this life? There are lots of places and lots of ways to be working. The question is, are you? When it comes to, 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 to our church, for instance, this church turnaround thing where we're trying to, to rescue a church that was struggling and, and give it new life again, doing that means all of us, everybody on board, doing something. That's why we have that board out in the lobby so that you can go out there and go, hey, I could do that. So please check that board out. Go to that, match your gifts and abilities, your passions, your desires with one of the things going on there. But really, it doesn't have to be here. It could be at your job. It could be at your home. It could be at some place that you just love going and serving throughout the week, whatever. My friend talked about uh, in, the, in his home growing up, they had, their refrigerator had a list on it of all the chores every week. And uh, those chores, this, the, they, they would have to write their names next to the chores and say, okay, I'm going to take care of this job this week doesn't have to be here, but is your name on a list somewhere? Is your name on the, on the refrigerator somewhere? If you are, great. But if you're wondering about how you could be working or thinking through the return of Christ and getting ready for that, working here is one option available to you, and there is a massive amount of places where you could. Now, to close, every week, to get ready for this, I read somewhere between a dozen and two dozen different scholars to try to understand this passage before I come talk to you about it. And this week, I've got this throat thing going on, and so it's been sapping my energy, and so I'm just like, oh, I'm so tired. And there's this one last book. I saw it on my bookshelf. I'm like, I don't want to read that one. But I did, and I'm so glad I did because he helped me understand the return of Christ in a way that I hope is super helpful for you. Um, he put it like this. He said, quote, for the early church, this watchfulness for the return of Jesus 
served less as a threat and warning that they would not be caught unprepared than as a joyous anticipation of the blessed hope for which they prayed and longed. Why is that? He says, when the early church thought about the return of Christ, it wasn't a threat or a warning to them. It was something that they got excited about. And the question is why? I think the, que- the answer is this. They took Jesus' words seriously. They were confident that his words were true. They longed for it. They prayed for it. That They were excited about it because they were confident in his word and, and they were actually watching and they were actually working so that this moment had nothing to do with fear or warning. This had everything to do with, yes, come, come, show up, end this whole thing. He, and he ends it by saying this, Maranatha and your kingdom come were daily in their prayers. And this produced hope, comfort, and expectation. What was true of the early church can also be true today for all who love his appearing. I was talking with, with a guy after the service, the last service, and he goes, You're, the, the end kind of caught me thinking, like, you know, when, when my wife and I were having our, one of our, our, our first child, we got, we got ready, we got ready and everything, and we, we packed bags and we got our phones and all that stuff, we got ready. And what was the result? The baby. And he goes, and then I was thinking too, like before that when we got married, there was all this planning and planning and talking to these people and doing all this stuff, but we did all that planning and then what was the reward? The wedding. It's the same thing here. Christian, think about this. You will see him. You will see him. Your faith will become sight. This world will pass away and everything that you've longed for, you will see it for what it really is. The question is, are you ready for that? Are you saved? If you are, are you growing? Are you killing sin? Are you bringing it in your life? Or are, you push, or, or, or are you pushing it away? Whatever it is, whoever you got to talk to, whatever thing you got to fix, you're going to see him, and it could happen today. Are you ready? Not next week, now. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. May we all be ready. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the good shepherd. And we are so grateful to you for the way that you're shepherding us through this passage and through this this talk of end times. Jesus, what a powerful way to conclude challenging us to be ready for you to return at any moment. Jesus, be gracious to us. Every single one of us comes in here in a different place, which means every one of us needed this message, but every single one of us needs it in a different way. I don't know what those ways are, but you know what those ways are. So take the truth we talked about, please, Jesus, and let us know how to apply this specifically. Whether it's fixing some relationship, whether it's confessing some sin, whether it's getting rid of something in our lives, or whether it's, it's, it's working for you in some way, like who knows, I don't know. You know. So I trust you to make this real in my life and the lives of the people here this morning. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.